Hello, everybody, and this is Stacey Chalemi from The Advisor, and today I'm so excited because we have a best-selling romance author here today, and her name is Marisol James, and she is an amazing writer, and she has a bestseller she's going to talk to you about today, but she has not, she's not just a romance author. She has an amazing story that she's going to share with you, and she, you really want to listen to her story because it's going to it really open your ears, your heart, and really possibly change your life when you hear the story that she has to share with you and how she went from one extreme in her life to another and, you know, where and how she got to where she is today. So Marisol, you know, thank you so much for coming on the show. I'm really excited to have you on. Can you tell people a little about yourself and what you do? Hi, Stacy. Thank you so much for having me. Um, okay, first, I'm Canadian. I was born and raised in a very small town in Canada, but I left Canada when I was about sort of 19 years old. <laughs> I've lived in Poland. I've lived in Asia. I've traveled all over the world. I'm now based in England, though. So I'm a bit of a world traveler, I have to say. Um, I've written 30 books spread over six different series. All wow. of my books um, kind of are interconnected, which is what something that my readers love about my books is they'll be reading along one series and a character from a different series will kind of wander in. So it's like Easter eggs all over my yeah. books, which mm -hmm. people love. Um, so that's the kind of writer that I am. It's romance. There's a lot of them. But it's really, there's plot, there's character development, there's a lot of inter interwoven, intertangled stories. There's a lot of social elements that I bring up in my writing. Mm -hmm. So it's um, romance with a little bit of a a little bit of a social conscience, I would say as well. <laughs> now, you know, what gave you the passion to want to go into romance writing? You know, what gave you that mission, that drive to really want to go into that direction in your life? <laughs> well, I, I didn't really. I wanted to be a writer. I knew I always wanted to be a writer from the time I was very, very small. Um, when I was nine years old, back in Canada, I was diagnosed with cancer. And I lived in the hospital for three years. And so obviously, wow. I was going to school in the hospital when I was well enough between the radiation, the chemo, the surgeries, all the rest of it. Um, and the one thing that even when I was at my sickest that I could manage to do was I could read. And I was encouraged to write. So from the time I was nine, I was writing already quite adult sort of um, hard things for a nine-year-old. It helped me process. It was like a diary, but I wrote it like fiction. So as I got older, I always wanted to be a writer. Um, and then I kind of got distracted by other people's voices. My father wanted me to be a lawyer. My mother wanted me to go into business or academia. And nobody makes a living from writing anyway. I mean, especially back then, if you didn't have an agent or a publishing house, forget it. <laughs> you know, just yeah. forget it. It was done. So I ended up going to university for international law, which was fine. Um, and then I kind of just got distracted. I got into business. I got into publishing kind of by accident but I was more of an editor in chief. So there was very little writing. Everybody else was doing the writing and I was managing the whole thing. Yes. Um, and then I ended up working as the chief operational director of Central and Eastern Europe. This is when I lived in Poland mm -hmm. and it was a publishing house. But again, I was running a whole bunch of people and sales and budgeting yeah. and all the rest of it. And then I got sick again. I got cancer a second time. Oh. Um, and I was immediately fired <laughs> from oh, the company. Wow. Yeah. yeah. So I got a beautiful severance package, but still I was suddenly unemployed. Yeah. So um, it was in November. And I remember it was in November because that was the month that, have you ever heard of NaNoWriMo, National Novel Writing Month? I've heard of it. Yes. Heard of it. It's in November. And the point of it is you write 50,000 words in the month and they're not even great words necessarily. It's just a push to write 
50,000 words. Right. And um, I had done it and I had written two very serious kind of, you know, contemporary literature, serious books, you know. Mm -hmm. Um, But then there was this year that there was a summer camp and they put us in cabins and it was all virtual. And this is when I was fired. And I was in a cabin with these two women named Angie and Ruby. And so I was fired. So I had nothing to do. So I finished my 50,000 words in two weeks. And I finished this really dark sort of dramatic Canadian based heavy novel, you know, Mm -hmm. but I still had two weeks left in the, the, you know, the, the camp sort of thing. So I said to Ruby and Angie, I said, what am I going to do for the last two weeks? I'm still unemployed. I'm, I'm not feeling well. I'm literally confined to a bed after chemo. Yeah. Right. And they said it was their idea. Actually, they said, why don't you write the opposite of what you've just finished writing? So instead of writing this kind of heavy, dark, novel why don't you write a really light-hearted romance yeah and I said I've never read a romance in my life and I hadn't at that point never read one yeah. and I said okay well fine so between the three of us we came up with kind of most stereotypical thing so I was like okay I'll write a sexy cowboy romance so I based it mm-hmm. on in the mountains in Colorado, uh, who inherited the ranch, who who moved over there to take it over. Everybody hates her. She hates everybody. Of course, they fall in love. But it was just, it was just fun. It was just fun. It was a way yeah. to spend two weeks and yeah. feel better and give my mind something to occupy myself. So that's what I did. And I finished it. I wrote it in two weeks. I wrote the book in two weeks. Um, and then I said, okay, well, that's that. And Angie and Ruby said, no, 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 you have to publish it. And I said, no, I'm not going to publish it. It was, it was just, it was a joke. It was just like, it was just a way to pass the time. There's nothing serious about this. They said, well, publish it. I said, I'm not publishing it under my real name. I'm a real serious writer. I've written all these heavy literature books. I can't contaminate my brand. I said, well, (laughs) I did. Came up with Marisol James. Um, put it on Amazon, self-published it, forgot about it. And then it became a best-selling beach novel that summer. <laughs> it's just I suddenly, it. these, these I people, I don't know how they found it. I don't know how they talked to each other about it. Suddenly everybody <laughs> got it. And I thought, oh my God. So Angie and Ruby said, we'll start a Facebook page so people can find you. I said, mm-hmm. why would they find me? And they said, because they're buying you their, your book. They're going to want to talk to you. So I said, right. fine. started a Facebook page. And I suddenly had followers and I had fans and I had people asking questions. And one thing they were asking was, where's book two? Where's the follow-up? Where's book two? And I'm yeah. thinking, there is no people. There is no book two. Like there was barely a book one. <laughs> Yeah, <laughs> There's no book too. I'm looking for a job. I'm fighting cancer. I've got stuff to do. But again, nothing to do. So I wrote book two. Also became a bestseller. And I thought, what is happening? Like, what is wow. happening here? Yeah. So next thing I knew, more readers, more followers, book three came out. And then I got tired of the sexy cowboys. So mm-hmm. I wrote a different, I started a different series and I wrote about, um, MMA fighters, like boxers and karate guys and everything. Yeah. That was a bestseller as well. So by this point, I had had four bestselling books in about six months. I had beaten cancer. I was on the road to recovery. I still hadn't found a job. And one day I kind of looked up and I looked at how much money I was making from romance writing. And it occurred to me that I was making more money romance writing this thing that was like a joke you know a way to pass the time yeah um and and I thought well I think I found my full-time job I think I have a full-time job so that was when I really buckled down and took it seriously and started writing a full-time and it became my um 
it became something that I, I loved because it was writing. And because, like I said, I, in, I bring in social elements, I bring in plots, I bring in character development, I bring in characters who you meet in the first book of the series, but then they each get their own book over the five or eight books. So yeah. they were, and then the first relationship in the first book, you see it progress over the eight books. So the first yeah. book they meet, the eighth book, maybe they have a, they have twins or something, you know? So yeah, you can yeah. follow the relationship beginning to end. Um, and so that keeps me engaged. That keeps me interested. Um, I, I can sort of, I can fall in love with my characters for a little while. I really worry about them. I care about them. And suddenly I was writing for a living, just not the way I, I imagined it would be when I was, you know, 11 or 12 years old. I thought I was going to be one yeah. of those, like a Margaret Atwood, like a serious writer, but um, I'm a romance writer and I take it seriously. <laughs> So I mm. consider myself a serious writer <laughs> and I've written 30 books. So it's not like I've been idle with these things, you know, I've put in a lot of work. That's amazing. You know, 30 books is a lot. Like I've written 20 and people like their eyes bulge out. Like you've written 30. That's, that's mm. truly amazing. And not only did you write them, but they became bestsellers. They, they were recognized by large audiences of people who love romance. So that's yeah. a huge accomplishment, yeah. you know, it's, um, and, and, you know, and you went through some really tough times. You, you beat cancer twice. That's, yeah. that's huge. First of all, having cancer as a child is, is so traumatic, you know, because as children, that's just, it's, you know, we look at life very differently as children. Maybe, maybe it's, it's a little bit easier when you're a child than you are adult. I'm not really sure, but it's like, you know, you had them at two different stages of your life and, and just the just, go, just, you know, experience that saying that word is scary, but having to go through it and then having the strength to beat it. And you just never gave up. You use that strength, that resilience that you got through, the, through your, your disease and you turned it into something positive. You became something that you always dreamt of becoming a romance mm -hmm. author. So that's, that's huge. That truly is huge. Well, I don't know. I mean, having, having cancer as a child, you lose your childhood, literally. Um, and then you lose your innocence and you lose, I mean, you lose friends at the hospital. So you, you understand very young what death is and that right. changes. But then the second time I had it, I was married. I was a mother of two beautiful little boys. And then all I could think about was they're not going to have a childhood. If I die, their childhood is over sort of in yeah. the way that mine was when I got right. sick. And I yeah. thought, I just, it just, it does something different to your head completely. Yeah. When, when you're a child, it's horrible and it's confusing and you're alone a lot of the time. So you become yes. very independent, very resilient. But then when you're a parent, when you're a mother, all you're looking at these children, you're thinking, I can't leave them behind. What, what will happen to them without me? Yeah. So I don't know which is worse. I, I really couldn't tell you. I don't recommend either. <laughs> Yeah, <laughs> I would say pick neither. Um, but yes, I'm I'm very, very, very lucky, very fortunate. Wow, that is some story. That is some story. And you know, you you've gone through a lot. And you you know, what what inspired you to like write these stories? Like what, you know, you came up with a synopsis, a theme, you know, mm -hmm. what you know, these characters you developed, you know, how, how did you develop these characters? Sometimes people, it just comes to them, or they might see something on TV, or they might dream about it, you know, like, what made you create these characters in your mind? How did you create these characters? And, and how did you, you know, what inspired you to, to, to write the story as you did? Was there anything, you know, some people, you know, I've, I've talked to many authors, fiction authors, and they take things some from their from their past and they incorporate it into their into their fiction novels you know or their fiction books and some mm -hmm. people just come up with these ideas in their head it's just the creativity in them what was your source that made you you know come up with these characters and these stories i my characters aren't based on anyone 
I can think of maybe three characters that are loosely based on real people. I would say my first female character, Julie, the one in the sexy cowboy book, was yeah. probably slightly based on me just mm-hmm. because I had never read a romance book. And yeah. um, I just I was just coming up with just ideas and spitballing. And I mean, Jake Weston was kind of those that, that sexy stereotypical cowboy ranch guy yeah. who doesn't talk much like kind of a Clint Eastwood but every yeah. cowboy you've ever seen in your life ever uh-huh. so that was easy but Julie was more complicated because she was a city girl she was in marketing um she had had a really rough childhood it made her very shut down and defensive and quite cold And I had a period in my life where that was how I dealt with things, probably because of being so sick as a child and being basically left on my own. My father was working. My mother was home with two small children and I was alone in a hospital, you know, just for days and days and days. And of course, overnights and so on. So um, there was a period in my life, probably in my 20s where if things got too much, too close, too emotional, I would just like completely shut down. And that's what Julie did. So I have to say probably in that case, I would say Julie's probably based on me. There's a lot of similarities there. And then there's another character in that series, Open Skies with Jake and Julie. Um, Her name is Maddie, and she's kind of an older ranch hand. She's been there since she was like 20. She's been there for 50 years. She knows everything. She bosses everybody around. Um, She was based on my grandmother. (laughs) (laughs) Honestly, Stacey, I have to tell you, besides Julie and Maddie, um, everybody else is just completely, just completely out of nowhere. I think... I tend to base a lot of the women on um, things I admire about women. um, I have a single mother with uh, twins, one of whom is autistic. Um, I uh, I have very artistic female characters, painters, Uh, sculptors, um, things I can't do, but I really admire that artistic ability in people. Mm -hmm. Uh, Photographers, um, I I do have a writer actually in in my Fighting for Love series, Mia is a writer, but everybody else is artistic in a way that I am not, which I've always admired in in other people I see. Yeah. And I pick, I I really like, oh, one of my female characters had cancer. So that's probably based on me, to be fair. But everybody else has just come out of nowhere, just completely out of nowhere. And the men are, I mean, they're kind of the dream man in a way, but every woman has a different idea of what the dream man is, who he is, what he looks like, where he comes from. And the one thing I really make a point of doing is... I take two people who are kind of, they have their own baggage, they have their own history, they have their own damage, and they kind of come together and they don't complete each other or they don't um, do that whole thing where I can't live without you, you know, where I'm changing for you. It was more, it's more that they support each other in ways that maybe they don't realize they need or they don't understand they need at first, but they come together and they're equally strong and committed to the relationship and they each bring their own um, gifts and that's really important. So when I start to write my characters, I, I sometimes I think of who are the most polar opposite characters I can possibly create and let's throw them together and we'll see how that goes. Yeah. Um, and of course, everything goes fine, but you tend to have obstacles or misunderstandings or you get together and then it's hard because they are so different. So I I think I get more inspired by either the situation I put my characters in, ill with cancer or um, investigating sex trafficking as a journalist or, um, you know, coming to back to a place where you swore you would never go. It was your childhood home, but you left and you swore you'd never go, but suddenly you're back again for whatever reason. And I like to put my characters in situations. One of my characters, her mother desperately needs a kidney transplant. Well, in the United States, if you don't have money, 
you don't get the kidney. So she yeah. had to come up with a lot of money quickly. So she had to go work for her ex-boyfriend who cheated on her three years before. So that's the wow. situation. Yeah. So what I tend to do, honestly, is put my characters in situations and then say, based on who they are, I kind of built them up in my head. How will they react in this yeah. situation? How will they behave? And that's when the story comes. That's where the story really happens. When I start from, let's throw them into this horrible, messy thing. And let's, yeah. see, what it is. let's see what, I don't know what's going to happen. Let's see what happens. <laughs> that's where a lot of my storytelling comes from. Wow. I love it. I love it. Oh my goodness. Now you had talked to me early on. You said that your writing was almost taken away from you. Like you mm -hmm. got to a point where you were thriving and then you, you, you know, again, you, you were hit with some obstacles that were really traumatizing, you know, can, do you want to share some of that with the audience and, and course, talk about sure. what happened and then how your writing was almost taken back from you and how you got it back and how you excelled to, you know, to, to another, I guess you can, you elevated yourself to another point in your life where now you're in a totally different space where you're thriving. Mm, yeah, okay. Absolutely. Um, let me sort of go back a bit. So uh, I was married and he and I decided to separate and divorce. Very amicable, no bad blood whatsoever. Um, he started a new relationship and then I started a new relationship, except um, I was living in Poland at the time and my new relationship started up in England because at the time I was going back and forth between Poland and England. Mm -hmm. um, my One of my series was recorded to audiobooks at that time. So I was mm -hmm. going to and from London to the studio to sort of supervise the recording of the audiobooks. And I met this guy. And uh, he and I sort of kept it going long distance for over a year. And then eventually we decided that I would bring my oldest son over to England and I would be with this guy and my son would live with us. And my, our other son, my, my husband and I, our other son, would stay in Poland with his dad. So that's what we did. And that's still the arrangement today. My youngest is back in Poland. The oldest is with me. So uh, my son and I moved in with this man. And it was, it was a great relationship at first. I mean, I, I left my son behind for this person you know i i left sort of the marriage behind jack the the whole thing behind and it was a great relationship and then he started his own business um but i was still writing i still had my own life but right. then he began to need some help with the business you know so it started mm -hmm. off would you mind helping with the accounts a little bit well sure of course i'll help you know i love you uh, and then it was like, well, you know, my, my current office manager is kind of an idiot. Can you start working a day or two a week so I don't have to depend on him? Well, of course, you know, at this point, it's like a family business, right? So yes. of course I'll help. And then okay, I've had to fire the office manager because he was really just really incompetent. So can you take over? And it's only a couple of days a week because there's not that much work. And I said, sure. And honestly, Stacy, before I knew it, I was working for his company for free, right? Like I wasn't drawing a paycheck, but wow. of course the bills were being paid and I had a roof over my head. So it was all like, it was kind of a paycheck, but it wasn't a paycheck because it wasn't going yeah. to my bank account. You know, I didn't have any control over it, but it just happened gradually. And you do these things for the, cause you want to support the man that you're with, you know, yes. it's important. Mm -hmm. right. um, and then I, I one day I kind of thought, well, I'm not doing very much writing. Like I was looking at my royalties and they were going off a cliff because I wasn't writing, I wasn't promoting. Yes. And I find I said, I said to him, I really want to get back to my writing. Like I'm happy to help you, but yeah. this this company is your dream. It's not my dream. Right. And he said, okay, okay, okay. Let's agree that you'll write two days a week. You'll work for the company three days a week. And I said, great. Um, and then and then lockdown happened, COVID happened. And um, suddenly I was home with my son who couldn't go to school, you know, so I was, I was taking care of that situation and my ex's company, uh, well, it was a small business. So suddenly he was so stressed about everything, you know, 
Um, and any job that came up, he was like rushing to do it. And I was rushing to make sure it happened. So yeah. again, no writing. And then it was during lockdown that he changed, my ex changed, and he became so angry all the time. Anything and everything would set him off. And um, he started to, to really get manipulative and he started to really play head games with me where um, he would come home enraged about something that had happened. And I would, you know, just sort of say, well, it's, it's not me. I don't know what to do with this. And he would yeah. say, well, it is your fault. It is your fault. Let me tell you how it's your fault. It's your fault because, and there would be some convoluted thing that had happened in his head. Yeah. And suddenly it had gone from him behaving inappropriately and me reacting, saying this is inappropriate, to suddenly I was on the defensive all yeah. the time. Suddenly I was in the position of I have to explain myself to the person who's behaving inappropriately. And then you start to think, well, why am I doing this, right? Yeah. So then what you do is the next time he comes in enraged about something, you don't push back. You don't say this is inappropriate because you've learned when you do you're in a fight for three days, like yeah. in the silent treatment. And then it's all your yeah. fault anyway. Right. Um, and while all this was going on, there was no writing. There was nothing. Um, eventually the kind of emotional, psychological manipulation and abuse turned physical. Um, but by that point, I was just, I was trapped. I, I was in lockdown. I had a son. And the only income into the house was his business. Mm. I had lost any independence I had financially. I wow. hadn't written, a, I hadn't published a book in well over a year by this point. And wow. even, when, even when he said, okay, you, today's a writing day, you can write, he would pick a fight. And then it would be, he'd be on the phone all day, or he would come back home, he would show up and carry on the fight or he would sit and watch television really loud so I couldn't concentrate and then he would say wow. it's my house I pay the bills I'm the only one working here um, I'll do what I want so he would sabotage literally sabotage my writing day so then the next day I would say well I want to write today because I lost yesterday he would say no you can't today the company needs you yesterday you just like you just you just bummed off you did nothing yesterday and I right. said well you came home and you argued with me all day yesterday he's like well do you know why I argued with you all day yesterday it's because you and there would be this list of things you know I had done for the past 18 months that he would go through again and then the fight would carry over to the next day and then suddenly there it was again, where he had come home, sabotaged my work, my independent work, but right. suddenly I'm the one on the defensive. And this was my life, Stacy. honestly, like this was my life for about three years. Wow. And one day I just kind of looked up, you know, cause you sort of, you lose it. You just, this is, you're just you're trying to survive day to day. And all you're thinking about is what do I do today to avoid making him angry? That's it. Yeah. How do I not make him angry? And one day he left the house in a great mood, came back in a terrible mood and started shouting and throwing things as always. And I just looked at him and this day, this day was different. I don't know what it was about this day, but it's like a, a switch goes off in your head, like a light switch just flicks mm -hmm. and I looked at him and he was raving and ranting and having one of his temper tantrums and I I didn't feel afraid and I didn't feel panicked mm -hmm. and I didn't feel like I had to calm him down or manage his emotions you know mm -hmm. or try to calm the temper tantrum I didn't feel like I had to explain or defend or do a single damn thing I looked at him and I thought it is always going to be like this. Like, this is my life. This is it. This mm. is it. Yeah. And I didn't care about him. Like, I didn't care enough to be angry or react or a single thing. I felt absolutely 
nothing. It was this weird flatness of just, you know, and I don't know if it was because I was so beaten down or I was just totally exhausted because of course I was, I was exhausted on every level after years of this. But I just remember I looked at him that day and I can tell you exactly where he was standing, where I was standing, what was like, I can tell you everything about that day because I remember the moment where I looked at him and I thought, this is never going to change. I have got to get out of this. And that was the, it wasn't the first time I thought I should leave, but it was the first time I knew I would a hundred percent. And so I started writing secretly. (laughs) I started (laughs) writing secretly behind his back. Um, I would take my laptop upstairs, like in hide in the bedroom, or I would, I would go out and bring my laptop and I would write where he couldn't get to me. You know, I'd go out for a cafe day. Right. Mm -hmm. Um, And I took writing assignments. I, 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 I did some ghost writing. I ghost wrote a couple of books and um, I did a lot of freelance, just writing ad copy for Christmas campaigns, like just anything, 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 just to sort of get the cash in. And I was very, in my own way, sort of cunning. And I'm not, I'm not proud of how I just sneak around and behave this way, but I also knew that I had to do it. It was survival by that point. So yeah. when I kind of saved up enough money, um, I basically took my son and we left. We, it's a complicated story how we left. We don't have to go into all that, but mm-hmm. um, we just left. And he, I left, I broke up with him, the, the my ex now. I broke up with him. It'll be a year next month. Um, and in that time, I've been a single mother <laughs> to a now 17 year old boy who's at college in England. And he and I have made this work for the past year. And wow. in the past year, I have carried on writing um, like freelance assignments, but I have also finally managed to finish the book <laughs> that I was trying to write all those years that he was picking fights with me. <laughs> and Mm -hmm. sabotaging me and taking literally taking a hammer and threatening to destroy my laptop like can you imagine destroy all my work just destroy it um and just the the lack of sleep and you know the 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 mental just just the mental turmoil all the time and I couldn't write about romance or love or healthy relationships or Uh good men who will support their women. I I couldn't write any of that stuff when I was with a narcissist who was just everything you don't want in a man ever. And I couldn't, I couldn't see love. Like I couldn't see romance. I couldn't see a good man. So how do I write it? How do I write it? Um, But over the past year, I have gone to some very good therapy. I've done a whole lot of work on myself. I can tell you. I've really worked with my son as well to help him because he was there for all of this, you know? Right. Mm -hmm. He didn't see most of it, but he saw enough. Yes. Um, So, and I've, I've managed to, so I, I, I've written the fourth book of a motorcycle club series and it will come out next month on August 12th. Um, And I'm actually, of all the things I've written, of all the books I've written, this is the one I am most proud of because it's the one that it's the first one I'll have written since leaving that horrible abusive situation. But it's also the one that I didn't think I would ever finish. I just didn't think it would ever happen. Um, It's taken four years (laughs) sort of beginning to end, to be honest with you, but um, it's done. It's, I mean, it's, it's done. It'll be published next month. Um, Gosh, in exactly one month, August 12th. So yeah, that's amazing that that will happen. So that is, uh, that's where I am. And that's how I got myself out of it. So I did lose my writing to a really abusive man. Um, he took it away from me and I didn't notice it happened that slowly, but it is what saved my son and I, it is what got us out of that situation. And it is something that as I've gotten stronger, and started to recover and started to to find myself again, I found that I was desperate to express myself in writing again, just 
desperate. So yeah. I started writing and I could once again see the good men. I could see the romance. I could see the love. I could see the optimism, yeah. the positivity. Um, and so that's, that's where I am right now with my writing. I have reclaimed it. That's wonderful. Oh my goodness. That is so wonderful. Now, did you, did you, in the beginning of the relationship, did you realize he was a narcissist when, cause a lot of times people come into relationships and they, it, they're totally different when they first meet them. And then as time gets on and it goes on and, and the person gets more comfortable, you, you know, their, their true colors start to slowly, you know, you know, show through. And some people may realize that they're a narcissist. Some people may be in denial and some people may be so fearful that they don't want to do anything because they're so scared. You know, mm -hmm. what kind of comments do you have for those people who, who might feel one of those three things? Well, I can tell you when he, when I first met him, he was, he was amazing. He was amazing. Um, physically my type, um, just supportive, loving, funny, open, giving, honest, like all of the positive adjectives when it comes yeah. to a relationship that you want. He was all of those things. And I, I just, I didn't see it. I didn't see it at all. But what I've realized over the past year of therapy, because I did work with a therapist who was very, very experienced in sort of narcissistic trauma <laughs> like what it yeah. does to you what it does to your head you know yeah. mm -hmm. um and i i was talking to her about it and what i realized is that it was all a mask like that person that i fell in love with that i moved my son in with you know mm -hmm. never existed but the problem with the narcissist is they can't keep it up you know it starts to slip it starts to slip so there would be times where he would get irrationally angry like his reaction was disproportionate to whatever had happened and yeah. I would think like what is that but then you know people get tired people have bad reactions to things people lose their temper you know it it's human so I thought well I guess he's just and it was when he was starting his own company it was just in the beginning so I thought well he's really stressed he's really worried he's just left a, 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 a solid paycheck to now this thing and you know yeah. Mm -hmm. um, thank God I have my writing. I'll take care of us. <laughs> it's what yeah. I thought. Right? Right. Um, yeah. but he was just really stressed. So it's not that I was making excuses. It's just, I thought there was an excuse. I thought there was legitimate reason. Yeah. And then, but then the first, the guy from the beginning always came back. There would be this weird outburst. And then that guy would come back and I would think, yeah. okay, well the outburst is the anomaly. And this mm -hmm. guy that he is, is the is the, is the standard it's the norm yeah and then what happens and i think anybody in an abusive relationship would say this is the pattern where kind of the period where the first person the one who showed up in the beginning that person shows up less and less and for a shorter and shorter time and the other person the one who catches you by surprise the abusive yeah. person in his case the narcissist shows up more and more and sticks around for longer. So in the mm -hmm. beginning, you have this beautiful person and you have these weird like blips of the narcissist abusive. Yeah. And mm -hmm. then the narcissist, at some point it, it flips and suddenly the abusive narcissistic personality is the norm. This is yeah. who they are. And, but every and then you start to push back or you start to question, or you start to say, well, that's it. I'm out of here. I'm not putting up with this. And then yeah. that person from the beginning, guess what? They reappear. They're back, mm -hmm. you know, and it yeah. pulls you back in. And then you think to yourself, you have hope because that person is still in there. They are, they exist. They weren't a figment yeah. of your imagination. <laughs> They're still yeah. there mm -hmm. and, and they'll come back. And then of course, all that means is they bring them back to kind of, um, shut you up yep. or like, stop you packing your bag and leaving or stop you questioning them or really pushing them or pushing back. And then everything's great for three days a week. And then guess what? It starts to, the, the mask is off again and the bad behavior creeps back in. And yeah. then after a while, it's just, 
you become so exhausted by it. You become so demoralized by it. You get so, um, I don't even know the word. You're so manipulated. You're just so manipulated by it. And yeah. he would, he would gaslight me so effectively that I wouldn't even be sure what had happened or what yeah. had been said or what had been done. Mm -hmm. um, and then you're just in your, you're in your own head all the time and you're so messed up. You're so confused. You can't think of anything except how do I avoid him getting angry again? Yeah. And when that's all you see, when your whole life is, um, how do I stop him from reacting badly or behaving badly? Then everything about you just goes, your, your physical, um, health goes because you're so stressed. Mm -hmm. You're not sleeping. You're in a, you're mentally, you're a mess because all you can think about is how do I not make him angry? How do I keep the house calm? How, you know? And emotionally, yeah. you're a disaster because this person that you fell so in love with, who said they loved you, yeah. I was with him for six years, beginning to end. Yeah. And you're looking at this, you're living with a stranger. You're just, yeah. you don't know who this person is. So you right. don't even know who you love, right? Yeah. And this is the insidious, really horrible part of emotional and psychological abuse much more so than physical because there was physical abuse but that wasn't even the worst part that I had to recover from although my shoulder is completely destroyed I'm still going for treatment on my shoulder that he wrecked but my headspace that was the thing that when I finally like had that moment with the light flick and I was like well this time yeah. I'm leaving and nothing he did he begged he cried he cried he got on his knees in front of me and he wept he went to therapy uh, I'd, I'd been begging him to go to therapy suddenly he was in therapy and the therapist was telling him he was coming and sitting and talking to me and telling me that he realizes all these things I was trying to tell him which just showed me he could have done it all along he could have, but he didn't want to. He only right. did it because I was packing my bags and my son's bags. And he knew this time, um, but he didn't mean any of it. None of it was sincere. It was just another game. Yes. Um, and that's the part I had to recover from, honestly, over this past year was yeah. the, um, what the absolute, I mean, I, I didn't walk away from him. I crawled. <laughs> I yeah. was, it was wreckage. I was wrecked and it was the right thing to do, but it was a hard thing to do. And yeah. all I would have to say to somebody who, who was, who is in this situation or has left this situation is honestly, once you see it, you can't unsee it. It's important. Mm -hmm. You cannot, once you know, you're dealing with somebody like this, you, yeah. it's like suddenly everything opens and you just see the whole relationship you're not like this anymore thinking how do I yeah. keep them not angry suddenly you just everything falls everything falls away and once right. you see it you see it that's it there's no going back um and the second thing I would say is anybody who's left a situation like that is you have got to give yourself the time and the grace because yeah. it just because you've done the right thing leaving this person doesn't mean that you're okay you're not back to yourself yet you're not um you're not healed you have to right. give yourself the time because you need the time it, it there's it, the this the mental scars are the ones that probably i will still carry because i'm finally at the point where i'm thinking of dating again but i am so looking for red flags now. <laughs> yeah. I don't I don't, I'm the first time maybe a guy raises his voice, I'm going to be out of there, you know? So yeah. it, it will be a challenge. I think it's my new challenge will be dating now in the year 2024. Um, and I, I don't know how that's going to go because of him, how he was in the beginning and what he became. So that's, um, that's my next challenge, really. And I'm going to, I'm going to take it slowly. I'm going to take my time. I'm going to give myself everything I need. I'm not going to yeah. be in a rush because, um, like I said, you have to give yourself time and grace after something like this. 
Oh, a hundred percent. You need a healing process. You need to go through that healing process and that renewal process. And I think too, I think also something that's healthy is you don't compare them to him. Yeah, you know, everybody mm -hmm. that comes through the door is is give them a fresh start. When you go have an abusive relationship and you you live with a narcissist, you know when you get into another relationship, you know try not to compare them. Try to look at that person as a whole new person that has nothing to do with that person and you can just you know you'll probably be extra cautious and I think also you know try not to put the walls up so quickly because I think you know I see in a lot of relationships where they come from abusive relationships that wall goes up very quickly because they mm -hmm. don't want to be hurt and sometimes you know um to try to to try to trust you know as best as you can that's hard to do when you've mm -hmm. been hurt much, you know, especially in the ways that you've been hurt, you know? Well, it's hard to trust because one of the things I've had to learn over the past almost year is how to trust myself again, because that's what happens when you're in an abusive relationship. Any, any type of abuse at all is you, you can't trust them, but you sure can't trust yourself because you right. picked right? Like, why did I pick this person? Or what was it about me that attracted them to me? Why, why did they choose me? What did they see? And then you start to second guess everything about yourself. And then, you know, especially when in the case of my ex, who was so psychologically abusive, mentally abusive, yeah. I, I didn't know which way was up from day to day. And he would say something to me and I would call him on it immediately. And then his very next sentence was, I didn't say that. And I would say, you just said it seven seconds ago. He's like, I didn't say that. I would never say that. That's horrible. I'm like, well, mm -hmm. then you said it. And then suddenly you start thinking, did he say it? <laughs> I'm sure yeah. he said it. Um, and then you start to think, I can't trust my own experiences, eyes, ears, um, like things I'm, I'm sure he said, or things I'm sure, things I'm sure I did, or things I'm sure I didn't do, and then you suddenly don't, you don't trust yourself either. You don't trust your experiences, your own senses, none of it. And one of the things I had to relearn this year was I had to trust myself because it's me and my son, and um, it's just the two of us. I'm, I'm responsible for both of us. I'm a single mom. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> and I have to make it work. So right. I'd, better, I'd better figure out who I am and start trusting that and yes. standing by it. Yes. And that was, that was hard. That's really hard. So that's something else. I think after you leave a really abusive situation, I think is you have to relearn not to trust other people so much, but to trust yourself. And that is hard because you feel like you let yourself down. I lost my writing. I felt like I let myself down so much when I did that and yeah. I had to forgive myself for it and pick it up and, and carry on. And what gave you the resilience to, to pick it up and carry on, you know, cause so many people I see in life give up so easily, you know, they go through a hard time and they just give up. They just lose, they lose life within themselves you know, and that didn't happen to you. You, 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 kept, you this made you stronger, obviously, and mm. you were able to move forward and, and hold on to that, that love for writing and then start to create again. You know, how did you get that resilience to move forward and want to create again? That's actually a very good question. How, how did I do that? <laughs> um, I, I would, I would, I, I would guess a few things. First, I would say that again, um, being, being so sick, so young, where I had to become resilient and I had to become very mentally strong. My mm -hmm. body was failing, but I had to keep going, you know? I, and I, when you learn that as young as I did, I think it's something that it just, it's, it's, it's hardwired into you at that point. I know a lot of people who went through childhood trauma don't come out stronger. It is something that can hurt them for, for their lives. But I had amazingly supportive parents. I had an amazing doctor. 
the neighborhood around us pulled together, all of yeah. the neighbors pulled together. I never felt unsupported ever. And I think all of that helped. It helped me feel very, very loved. So I think I came out of that, um, I wouldn't say unscathed, but definitely supported and, and mentally healthy, which is kind of amazing if you think about it. Yes. But I would also say that it's just the writing itself. It has always been how I've expressed myself. I, I can't, I'm not creative any other way. And I'm actually, <laughs> it's kind of strange to say on a podcast, but I'm an incredibly shy, introverted person. I'm talking to you because you know, yeah. you're you and you're wonderful. But the mm -hmm. thought that you know, more than two, two other people might hear this it freaks me out slightly. So I don't think about it because of my yeah. mind there, I get a little bit weird, but right. I have always been so brave in my writing. I have always been really, I guess, I guess the only word is brave. I have, yeah. I have written things that I would never in a million years say, mm -hmm. right. Or I have, yeah have written on topics and this is not just my romance but my other writing as well like my short stories and my novels the more dark contemporary literature I have tackled some really hard stuff and I stand by it and I'm fearless about it that's it my, my right in my writing I'm fearless in a way that I'm probably not in my day-to-day -day mm. life right and when I lost it and I became afraid every minute of every day living yeah. with an abusive man. And then I wasn't afraid of him anymore. Like mm -hmm. that day, the flick, right? Yeah. I wasn't afraid anymore. Um, and as soon as I stopped being afraid of him, as soon as I saw him for the little pathetic, weak bully that he really was, Right. Mm -hmm. As soon as I saw that in him, like the little yeah. screamy boy temper tantrum throwing things. Yeah. Who, this big man who can't control his emotions like a two year old. As soon as I saw that, I stopped being afraid. And it's like I got my voice back. And how do I use my voice? I write. That is how I express myself best. So I would say that. I needed my writing and my writing needed me by the end. And as soon as I stopped being afraid of him and being afraid of my life, and I started feeling brave again and fearless, the mm -hmm. first thing I wanted to do was write because that was the only place that I could be that way. And, yeah. um, and then the more I wrote, the stronger I felt, and then mm -hmm. the money would come in. So the more secure I would feel. And then yes. I would write more because I was fearless and I was secure. And then more money would come in. And then you get yourself into this amazingly empowered cycle of um, what I'm doing is making me stronger. It's making me express myself. I'm getting a reward from that, something tangible, right? Not just my sense of self, but actual dollars in my bank account or in my case, pounds, right? Yeah. Um and then it all feeds into it. And next thing you know, it's, it's not easy, but it's, it's your life. My life went from being afraid of him and cowering and everything was his way. Everything was about wow. him to um, honestly, just, just being fearless and expressing myself. And that's, that's why I didn't lose my writing, I think. And that's why I went back to it right away after I, um, stopped, stopped being afraid of him and stopped being afraid of, I can't do this without him. I'll never make any money. I'm so dependent on him financially. I can't do this. And then I realized yeah. actually I could, and then you start doing it. So then you do it more. So I can understand why people give up. I can understand why people get overwhelmed. I can understand how people lose things they love because yeah. sometimes it's just so hard. It's too hard. Um, again, I'll, I said it earlier, I'm very lucky that I, I could get back to my writing and I could still love it and embrace it. Yeah. And I'm very lucky my readers haven't gone anywhere. <laughs> they, uh -huh. 
they haven't gone anywhere. And when I told them what had been happening, like I took a photo when my son and I moved into our new house, I took a photo of the boxes, which were just yeah. the floor ceiling boxes. And I said, this is what's been going on. This is why I haven't been writing. This is why I haven't been posting on Facebook. I couldn't, I just couldn't do it. They were immediately so supportive and right there and they're waiting for the book and I know they're going to buy it. And I know that, um, it will pay the bills for another few months. You know, I, I, I know they're going to be there. They yeah. are, they are there. They're still here. They haven't gone anywhere. I've received so many private messages from my readers who have left abusive situations or have a narcissist in the family. And That's they know, they know what it was like to be in that. And they know how hard it was to leave it, what, how dangerous it was to leave an abusive yeah. situation. It's risky. It has to be planned. It has to be timed. <laughs> you know, it, it takes, it takes effort. Um, and they are just the best readers in the world, honestly, that they haven't gone anywhere. They, they never gave up on me. They still have my back and they will buy anything I write. So of course I'm going to keep writing. <laughs> oh, <laughs> oh my God, that is wonderful. Now, if yeah. you had to take everything that we talked about today and you want to emphasize on certain points, what do you, would you like to emphasize to the listeners today? Um, to stay open to things that you never thought you would do in your life. I ended up in writing completely by accident, ro romance writing, you know, yeah. um, and it has saved my life, my sanity. It, it was something that I fell into as a total accident. And now it's my biggest passion. I love it. I'm so happy I can do it. So wow. just because you're going down a certain path in your life and something kind of like pops up on it and you think yeah. that is so not me, I don't mm -hmm. be so sure. <laughs> <laughs> you never know where it might take you. You, you exactly. might surprise yourself, you know, in 10 years time, you might look back and go, I'm so glad this is straight across my path, you know, right. Thank God exactly. for Angie and Ruby with their crazy suggestion of writer romance. Cause mm -hmm. I, I would never have done it if it wasn't for them. Right. Um, second thing I would, I would say in terms of, um, yeah, find a way Trying to think how to say this. Find a way to be fearless in your life. Find some way to be brave in your life. It doesn't have to be writing. It can be anything. Something that makes you feel strong, empowered, centered, independent. Just something that you you do it and you 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 don't care how it turns out. You don't care who's watching. You don't care if nobody sees it, buys it, likes it. It doesn't matter. It is a it is you expressing yourself in the most genuine, authentic way possible. Find that thing. I don't care what, it, you can bake. It can be baking. <laughs> you know, you can do crazy experimental baking that nobody likes, but you think it's amazing. Yeah. Um, but find that thing. Like I would say your thing is probably this podcast, you know, reaching out to people and talking to people. And it's a chance yeah. for you to be open, fearless, um, you know, just amazing. Everybody has to find that thing. And yeah. once you do, protect it. Because I lost my thing for about three years. Yeah. And it just about killed me spiritually. I mean, he was he was destroying me physically, emotionally, psychologically. But yeah. I wasn't expressing myself. And I was dying a spiritual death because of that. So yeah. I would say protect your thing, <laughs> protect mm -hmm. that thing that makes you fearless and that you express yourself properly, because that is the thing that's going to pull you through the really, really hard times. And who knows, it might even literally in my case, like save your life. You just, you don't know. That's why you have to guard it, yes. cherish it, protect it. I love it. That's great advice. That is truly great advice. Thank and you. also, where can people find your books? Um, uh, well, if they want to go to my website, which is marisoljames.com, uh, there's a drop-down menu that leads to all my series, all six of them. And then you can find my books on Amazon exclusively. So it's amazon.com, UK, AU, CA, all of them. I'm international. 
Um, and also on my website, there's a newsletter. You can sign up for my newsletter. You can follow me on Facebook. I'm not as active on Instagram. I'm starting to get a bit more into Instagram now, but my, my website is really the best place to find everything about me. And if you want to sign up for the newsletter, I do bring out news. I, I do interviews with other romance writers. I give sneak peeks of upcoming books. I run contests where you can win a free book. Or one, one thing my readers love is I give them a chance to name a character in one of my books. So they suggest a character name and I choose one. And then that person gets a free copy of the book where they named a character, which is always that. a popular competition. Yeah, people really like that. Yeah, it's fun. I I, all my books right now are eBooks, but I'm literally in the process of formatting all 30 of my books for print. So as soon as those are available, I will put them up on the website and I will run some contests for some free signed copies. But of course, I'll, I'll, I'll announce that on Facebook, Instagram, and my newsletter as well. Oh, I love it. I love it. That's wonderful. Maybe you can and name one of my characters, Stacy. Maybe I'll name one Stacy. I don't think I have a Stacy. Do you know that? Oh, I love that. I love that. I don't have a Stacy. <laughs> <laughs> I would be honored. <laughs> she can be a podcast host. Yeah, there you go. <laughs> I love it. I love it. Oh my God, this has been wonderful. And, you know, if anyone wants to contact you about, you know, some of the things that you've gone through and they're going through similar situations, can they contact you on your website? Yeah, if you go to my contact me page, there's a direct link to my email, which is jamesmarisol at gmail.com. Again, probably the best, easiest um, port of call would be my website because everything is on there. Contact, books, newsletter, social media, all the rest of it. Everything's there. I love it. I love it. This is, you know, this has been amazing. And I'm excited because maybe I will be a character in your book. <laughs> <laughs> well, no, I have to. I've said it in front of how many people? No, I don't want to think about how many people. I've said it in front of you. I've promised you. So now I'll do it. <laughs> okay. Oh, this has been wonderful. Marisol, you've been a wonderful guest. You've had so much valuable information you shared from, you know, from how you started your, your childhood, you know, so into like, you know, your, your life and, and, you know, things that you had to overcome and how you developed your love for, for writing and how, you know, you, you still had obstacles that came in the way and you overcame everything. And now, you know, you went through something and you got your life back and you're back where you want to be and you're success, you're successful and you're excelling and all your books are a success. You're a best-selling, you know, romance writer. And I'm very proud of you. you you've done a great job, a very Thank great you. job. Thank you. I, um, it's not, I mean, it's not how I would have chosen my life to kind of um, unravel or unwrap, but I, I firmly believe that um, really doing hard things makes us not only human because people yeah. have to do hard things but it really really gives you a, the will to carry on to live to succeed to push and the next time a challenge comes along you sort of think yeah I got this <laughs> I've got <Yeah>. this <laughs> I, I think it's amazing what you're doing. And, you know, I, it's funny because I don't think life, we can't, it's impossible to plan our lives out. Everything I thought I was going to do in life, I ended up not doing. And my life took a total different journey. And I, I never thought I would be doing the things I do now, you know? So it's like, I think everything is predestined. I really do. I think there's a reason why everything happens to us. And, you know, you just go with the flow and you just, you know, overcome the obstacles. And there is a plan, I think, for every single one of us out there. You know, we just have to, you know, have have the faith and believe and overcome and, you know, through and just be positive. Positive is key, you know, through every negative thing, try to pull out something positive, I say, you know, and just, you know, and know that there is a rainbow at, at, on, the, on the end and, you know, just waiting for you. 
And so we have to really, you know, just focus on, you know, taking that journey, overcoming those hard obstacles and focusing on, you know, reaching that rainbow. And I think if we do that, we will, we will succeed. You know, it's, it's, you know, mind over matter, I believe. And being brave, just taking those chances and those risks and okay, you're going to fall on your face. Okay. So what, (laughs) so what you did it right. Um, yes. you get up and you try again, or you go and do something else, you know, but exactly. the second that I stopped being fearless, I think the second any of us stop being fearless, um, about trying, you can, you can be afraid and do something, but yes. you're, you're not afraid of the try you're afraid of, is it going to screw up? Am I going to be humiliated? Am I going to be laughed at? Is it going to be a disaster? You're not afraid of the trying. You're afraid of the potential failure from the trying. So as yeah. long as you're fearless about trying things, yeah, um, I th- I think that you're you're always moving forward. Just maybe not in the ways or directions you thought you would. Because every time yeah. you take that chance, you might end up somewhere different. You never know. Yes. Like when my when my friend said put your sexy cowboy book on Amazon and sell it. I went, that is ridiculous. I'm not doing that. (laughs) But I did. And Mm -hmm. now you you just, just try, just try. What's the worst that can happen? You fail. Oh, for God's sake. I mean, (laughs) I feel, I feel at something every day. I keep trying, you know, I think we all do, you know, It's, it's just getting up, you know, we fall back we get right back up and that's what makes us who we are, you know? Yeah, I agree. I agree. Yeah. Definitely. Well, this has been wonderful. Thank you so much, Marisol, for coming on the show. This has been a wonderful experience. I hope, you know, you come back on the show and we can talk some more, but uh, th- thank you so much. This has been a great experience. Thank you. 